Mountain Blade 2 Bannerlord has six different major factions, and each one of those factions has units within them. But the big thing you're probably wondering is, which faction has the best units, or at least what is an overview of some of those units? So in this video today, I'm going to be exploring all six of those factions. Uh, my original goal here was to talk about each one of these factions, and which one had the best units of so on and so forth. And I was going to use numbers to back that up. But unfortunately, the game is still in early access, and as I will show you throughout this video, some of those numbers aren't quite 100% accurate yet. There are going to be some patches that will fix and change things in the future. So instead, I decided to make a video that will help prime you to decide which faction you want to choose from a unit perspective. We'll go over again about three pros and cons per faction and what their overall theme is and how it will better or maybe not go alongside with your style of play. And to accomplish this, we're going to be using the encyclopedia. If you do not know about the encyclopedia or you did not see my nine useful tips guide in the upper right corner, um, I highly recommend you check that out. But the encyclopedia is a wealth of information. It can give you um, tons of stats on heroes, their locations, troops, the relative strength of kingdoms right now, a bunch of stuff. But for this video, we're going to be jumping into the troops line. And we're also going to click soldier occupation. And for the very first one, we're going to talk about being Valandia. We're then just going to kind of go down this list and talk about three pros and cons per um, individual culture. Now, Valandia is quite fun. Um, let's take a look over here. They have some of the best crossbowmen in the game. Uh, with Pavises after rank 3. So tier 4 and tier 5, they get access to a nice Pavis on their back, which is a large um, heater-style shield. And this is going to give them a lot of durability, allow them to deal with any kind of uh, return fire from other archers, and of course, give them the kind of stocky abilities when it comes to uh, dealing with other Cav. Use that shield, use that sword, they can at least kind of hold their own for a little bit. In addition to that, they have exceptional polearm infantry between the Volgier and the Pikemen. This is a really nice uh, alternative to a lot of other factions that don't get access to this at all. Um, and also they have their uh, Valandian Sergeant, which has an emphasis on polearm as well as a mace, have allowing him to do a nice amount of damage to armored units. In addition to this, they also get an access to a wide variety of heavy cav that is both light and durable. Your light cav, then of course to your Valandian Vanguard. But they also have their own specific heavy cav line in their Valandian Squire, which progresses down to the Valandian Banner Knight. So this heavy cav option uh, gives you a lot of diversity. I would say that Valandia has the best heavy cav in the game as far as its overall uh, flexibility and its ability to really do a lot of damage. Now, don't get too hung up on the numbers on these because a lot of them are going to change or some of them are just outright wrong. And I'll show you that when we go to talk about uh, Batania. That's one of the really good examples. But... Now that we've talked about the pros of Valandia, what are the cons? Well, they are pretty limited in their heavy uh, their heavy troop options. So if I jump back over here, um, we can see that their heavy option, their heavy infantry, really doesn't get heavy until tier five, and all of that tier five infantry doesn't even have shields, so they're not that durable. In addition, your table, you're looking at medium armor across the board with again late tier heavy armor with the Valandian sergeant, and they have no access to bows except for specialist lines and zero access to horse archers. Their boar veteran here uh, gives them some minimal access to uh, boars, or I'm sorry, <laughs> not boars, uh, minimal access to bows with their uh, poacher line as well. So again, Valandian is going to be a great faction or culture for you if you want to find recruits that specialize in a lot of heavy infantry and a lot of polearm, I'm sorry, polearm infantry and a lot of heavy cav. Our next culture is going to be Batania, and the Batanians have a little bit of a glass cannon approach, so let's take a look at this. Um, they have a lot of skilled but lightly armored infantry types, with javelins in the skirmisher line down here. And javelins are, are a lot of high risk, high reward. They're a little bit harder to aim, but they do a lot of damage, especially to armored units. In addition to that, you're talking about dedicated and powerful uh, cheap shock troops in the Falksman line here, from the Raider down to the Falksman, over here to the Veteran Falksman. Now they do get a little bit more armor in that case, but this allows for a nice cheap shock troop, but it does have some lighter armor um, in these two tiers and gets a little bit stockier in the latter tier. 
Um, and also, they have excellent, heavily armored shock infantry archer troops in these wildlings. So the Batanians really get access to a lot of really fun units, and I think it takes a little bit of a tactical genius to use them properly, because across the board, they have very weak melee and skirmish-style cav units. In addition, the entire faction is pretty lightly armored for the most part and you have little to no access to actual horse archers. And you do have some uh, specific ones with this, uh, the boar champions and the boar veterans here. You can see them. Uh, there's one of the specialist lines. Um, let me go back here to troops. Uh, the Chosen Wolves, that was it. Uh, Chosen Wolf is one of their specialist lines. The boars were the uh, Valandians, actually. Um, so here's an interesting thing. Um, the, the Young Wolf, Seasoned Wolf, and Chosen Wolf are part of their specialist lines. And then we also get um, the Skane, Kern, and Red Shank. Now, this is what I was talking about. Don't get too hung up on the numbers. The Red Shank is using a bow and arrow in this picture. He is a range unit. But if I look at this, his bow skill is 20 and his crossbow is 130. So, again, don't look at the numbers. Look again what the kind of unit is wearing on its actual little uh, paper doll here or, or no, it's a character model or the actual picture to get a better idea of what it's going to be able to do. Because even if you look at the Kern, uh, this thing is supposed to have throwing skill, but it has zero and it's got javelins on his back. So try to kind of keep that in mind with your unit choices that some of these are a little bugged right now and they are going to be a little bit different as we move through an early access kind of treat this like a like a more advanced beta plus but keep that in mind when you're playing Batania. Our next culture is the Empire, and I think the Empire overall is one of the easiest factions to start out in. I believe the game actually drops you in most Empire territory because the Empire has a very well-rounded faction. Uh, if we were talking about Batania before, lightly armored but heavier damage, more glass cannon, and Valandia, which is again more heavy cav. Now, when we take a look at Empire, we get a long, a, a strong and, and diverse infantry with high armor and a nice balance between one-handed and two-handed trees. We have right here uh, to sword to shield, sword to shield, um, down to the infantryman and the legionary, which again is a nice balance. He, this guy does have access to pole arms. Um, he does have one-handed weapons, but if I go to the uh, Menavela, uh, I'm looking at two-handed and pull arm from these guys. Uh, they do have a one-handed weapon as well, but for the most part, um, this icon here is going to kind of give me an idea of what we're going to be dealing with, infantry or ranged. So you get a nice diversity across their entire tree here. I mean, it's pretty well split. I can see, okay, I get two units of heavy ca heavy infantry, two heavy like shock infantry with two-handed weapons, two access to archers, two access to crossbowmen. It's almost split down the whole entire line. Um, they get well-armored archer units as well, with access to both archers and crossbowmen with these two right here. And these guys are, are very, very durable. That's one thing to note, of course. High armor and durable cataphract units as well. So, their dedicated um, cavalry line actually starts on foot, interestingly enough, then progresses up to your elite cataphract. And they are devastating on the charge, but low maneuverability and not really as great in uh, concentrated hand-to-hand -hand combat with other uh, cavalry units because they tend to uh, actually already have their lance out. So in addition to all this, though, what are the kind of cons of the Empire? Well, they have a very limited access to horse archers. They only have one option that you probably saw here a little bit ago uh, if we jump back over to this one. And that's right here at the uh, Imp uh, Imperial Bucellarii. Um, in addition, they also have limited javelin units relegated to the specialist line or to this imperial trained infantryman. In addition to that, too, they have no access to dedicated polearm infantry. So when you're taking a look at the Empire, you're getting a very high durable fighting force and a very diverse fighting force. But you're kind of jack of all trades, master of none type scenario. And at the same time, you're also extremely durable. So I think the Empire is a very forgiving cultural choice as far as units go. Or if you want to add some diversity to your to your existing army, you can go to any Imperial outpost and get some nice Imperial recruits to push through the respective line to kind of bolster your army. Now that we've talked about the Empire, let's talk about the Sturgeons. And the Sturgeons are very interesting. They kind of have a very uh, heavily influenced Saxon, uh, Rus-style Russian military in the sense that you're going to deal with a lot of infantry and not a lot of cav. 
So taking a look at this, you're, again, you're looking at a heavy focus on sword and shield infantry. Uh, you're really going to be using the shield wall a lot with these guys. It is a formation style um, in your tactics menu when you jump into combat. But you're looking at a wide range of javelin cavalry. Uh, cavalry, sorry, I, I tend to drop that L in weird spots. And infantry archers, so it does make for a lot of strong range play. If you take a look here, you do have some nice archer units right here between these three. And then you have your um, javelin slash throwing units. That is both an infantry choice right here, as well as a cav choice right here. And you also get a specialist berserker line, right? The Sturgeon Berserker and the Ulfhednar. And on top of that, you do really get a nice amount of heavy infantry with the Sturgeon veteran warriors. Like, look at these guys. So I think if Vlandia has the best overall cav in the game, I'd say that Sturgeons have the best overall infantry in the game because that's their bread and butter. Are these big, nice veteran warriors, these shock troops that kind of hold the line and uh, allow your archers to really do some damage. Because, again, they don't have much access to... Um, cav. That is their big Achilles heel, as it were. They have limited access to heavy cav, especially. So if you take a look at their specialist line, um, I think every single faction has what I will call a royal line. Um, and this is um, usually pertains to a noble or a noble son, something like that. So the Sturgeon warrior son down to the Druzenic champion. Now, this is one of the only heavy cav options, and it is a specialist line. It's not easily accessed by just simply walking around Sturgia and selecting units. So it does have that unfortunate limited access to heavy cav. You want that heavy cav, you can just walk on over to Volandia and mix them in. You're not relegated to any one of these one cultures. You can just simply choose a bunch from different regions. But again, you're then looking at a lighter armor on the entire spectrum for Sturgia. So if we take a look again at the recruit, we're really not seeing much heavy armor until we progress into rank or tier five, tier four, you know, depending on whatever the unit is. Uh, you do get a Gambus in here over on tier three, and that's kind of rough, whereas most uh, other factions will at least have medium armor by this point. So lighter on the armor spectrum, and really they rely on their shields, especially up until tier five. And you're looking at multiple specialist lines, making it harder to recruit specific soldiers. So again, we have that royal line. You also get um, uh, the Vayargs here. Oh no, that's not the one I was looking at. The Huskarl Swordsman. So they have these specialist lines that unfortunately make it a little bit harder to jump down into Cav or into very heavy, durable uh, melee. So you do have to really be mindful of what you're doing tactically. Uh, but I still think that Sturgia's infantry is still very stocky and it can work very well in conjunction with either Empire or Vlandian cavalry. Our second to last faction is Kazate, and this kind of takes that uh, Golden Horde uh, Mongolian influence to a lot of their army. And you'll see it as we take a look at through all this. And Kazate has an excellent hybrid uh, horse, archer, melee, cav focus. And you get that through one nice dedicated branch from their main uh, recruitment unit, the, the Nomad. So this dedicated all-in-one cavalry tree, cavalry tree, uh, with horse archers and shock calves, um, really is nice because you get access to nice, strong shock cav right at tier three, out, out the gate here. And these guys can also double as doing some really good melee damage as well, with your Kazate Raiders, giving you some nice medium armored um, uh, horse archers pretty early in the game. Rank three is not that easy, not that hard to come by. You can even recruit directly into rank three. And that progresses down, of course, over the way into your heavy horse archers and your heavy lancers. So you do get access to a lot of really nice heavy cav in the later portions with access to medium cav in the beginning portions quite quickly. So while I'd say Volandia gives you the very strong shock cav that also is going to be quite good in, in combat, I think you get access to a lot of quick cavalry uh, in Kazate very fast. I think it takes a little bit more time for it to get going in Volandia than it does in Kazate. And I think it just would come down to um, the armor. I, there's no real definitive way to, to um, understand which you, which faction has better armor until we get better. I, I get a better idea of what each thing is individually wearing because there's no uh, armor field on here or anything like that. It's pretty much piecing together what they're wearing. Now, um, in addition here, they're mobile, but a hard-hitting force that can really outpace other armies because they have access to so many diverse types of cav. Now, in addition to that, though, they do have a, an Achilles heel like all other factions do. 
they have very limited uh, missile and infantry forces. Now, you wouldn't think that. I mean, you're taking a look at the nice medium to, to a nice heavier medium to a nice heavy archer right there. That's a pretty nice little, uh, little ditty. But they have no crossbowmen. And in addition, all of their infantry units are really spearmen. This is a spear infantry unit, then down here to the Dark Khan, which is, again, a, a more heavy armored infantry unit. He does seem to have some javelins on his back, so we can throw some javelins. Same thing with the uh, the Kazait spear infantry. But you really don't have any dedicated shock infantry with two-handed weapons or any kind of dedicated sword and board style infantry that's going to be able to go toe-to-toe -to -toe or create a, a nice shield wall. So with this spear infantry, you have to kind of worry about the amount of damage output they're going to do. They're going to go well against a lot of other cav, but they might not fare well against another strong infantry force. In addition to that, their specialist line is more horse archers, and the lance cav uh, doesn't really help out as well. Their royal line, as I'll call it, um, is just more lance cab, which is, which is again, nice. You know, it does have 220 pull arm and, and 280 bow. But like I said, some of these, some of these stats don't really line up, but their, their, uh, noble line or their, their Royal line doesn't fill any niche or doesn't help out with the, over, the innate weakness of this force. It just makes their, their, uh, glaring strength even more apparent. So I'd say that the Kazate and the next one we're about to talk about the Asurai are two very difficult armies to really get your mind around and i think it requires a lot of mobility to make these armies work the best and i think that that's pretty indicative with the amount of cav options that you have with the kazate last but not least is the asari we just mentioned just a little bit ago now i think the asari are unique in that they're probably the most challenging of all the factions i could tell from their troop choices you're not relying almost entirely you're not relying on on armor at all you're using your mobility to your best advantage with late 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 tier armor on almost all their units and medium armor on the tier 4 range but they have multiple recruitment lines adding high diversity to overall troop choice you have got your skirmishers which progress to archers your footmen which progress to nice sword and boards and then your mamelukes which are a nice diversity between both horse archers and dedicated horse combatants and you also have your Mameluke Palace Guard, which are nice two-handed shock troops. So you do get some nice diversity across the board. In addition, they specialize in extensive cavalry play from light skirmishing cav, all the way in these two, um, to medium armored horse archers around here, and heavy royal cav, which are in this line over here in the Ferris. Down, down to the Ver Vanguard Ferris is your uh, heavy uh, pole arm cav unit. Now, they also have those strong Mameluke units, which can be mounted archers or heavy two-handed infantry, which we mentioned just a second ago, but I still think it's definitely worth bringing up because they're very strong uh, portions of their army. But they do have some issues here. They have limited access to armor until Tier 4 and 5, like I was mentioning. Tier 5 being the heavily armored, with Tier 4 still, I mean, that's like just barely medium armor for the most part. And most of these, these lightly armored units, like I said, means that you're going to be relying on your speed and your ability to move around the battlefield. They also have two specialist lines. And my problem with these specialist lines here is, um, oh, sorry, I have Batania selected there. Uh, that's all right. My problem with these specialist lines is they don't really, they don't really do much. They're not a whole great addition, in my opinion. Uh, I think they're a little too similar to the Mameluke line in this one. And then, because they're, again, they're heavy horse archers. And then if I jump back over here to the uh, Jawals, I have my camel riders, which are cool, but the Bedouin don't really do anything for me. And I would assume that they're a little bit harder to come across, just like most specialist lines are. And I think that the last thing for the Asteroid that is, I guess, one of their weaknesses is, the, is that their cav is almost exclusively ranged. And the only melee cav is really medium armored at best, with the exception of the royal cav, which is pole arm and javelin based and less focused on um, lances and swords and shields. So Asteroid, I, I picture as a much more challenging, but probably a higher skill cap faction if you can really master how to play them and really get their their tactics down i think that playing the asteroid would mean that you'd be able to deal with any force pretty handedly as long as you're keeping your that high maneuverability all in all guys that brings our video here to an end 
And I just wanted to do this video to give you an idea of what each individual faction specializes in when it comes to their overall choices for troops. No faction is better than any one faction aside from how you want to play the game. That's the most important thing here, right? So when you take a look at Valandia, they're, they're really the, a hammer and anvil style faction with a nice strong line of infantry that uses heavy cav to smash into things. Batania is very glass cannony. Lightly armored, but heavy damage output. Sturgia has really, really strong infantry, probably the best in the game, but really lacks cavalry. Looking at the Empire, you have a nice balance of strong infantry as far as its durability of its armor and its moderate damage output. And looking at Asteri, their strength is again in diversity and mobility, as well as trying to realize their weaknesses and not trying to fall into those traps. And Kazate, I'd say, are really better at hit and run using your shock cap to the best of their advantage, using your shock infantry to jump in and do some damage. So it's really about choosing which recruits from which faction you want to specialize in in the beginning portions of the game. Uh, I'd say the beginning portions of the game are more focused about uh, being all over the map and choosing special places you want to expand to until you really decide where you want to focus your kingdom. And then I would say use your experience of using each one of these recruits and these units to decide where you want your kingdom to be placed and how you want your kingdom to grow with which units are really going to be your main focus. But as always, guys, thank you so much for watching here today. I hope this helped you out. If you have any feedback on your, your experience with the units, please go ahead and let me know in the comments below. We are still in early access, so a lot of things are prone to change. And if anything changes too drastically, I'll try to do an updated version of this video. But as always, thank you so much for watching here today. Don't forget to like, subscribe, all that fun action. But have a good one and take care.